I'm welcoming Michael Orman, another Beadle. Um, what is more than that, then we're gonna see later. So if you have any questions for us, go on to Twitter at Agile Lounge and you use the hashtag uh, Scrum Beer X, X like in 10 ramen number. So welcome, Mike. I'm really happy you're uh, with me in that uh, experiment, that Scrum Business Agility experiment, let's call it like this to actually um, pursue or continue the, this great uh, conversation that uh, we often had with Mike Beadle and so many others uh, about, uh, it, for me, I don't even want to call it a framework. I call it a state of mind, a, a way of being innovative and creative to help businesses and people uh, being better and smarter. What do you think? You know, I, yeah, I, sometimes I just call it ongoing open space, but we'll have to come to that story later on. Um, but it's great to be here and be part of uh, a conversation about Enterprise Scrum. And uh, uh, we haven't had as many of those uh, together as, as uh, we used to. So this is good. Cool. And um, how do we like, because, you know, a lot of people, as you mentioned a bit uh, offline, is they will say Scrum, so they think it's Scrum. And before that is Enterprise Scrum. But even before going into um, Enterprise Scrum, nowadays, how will you, and I will jump anytime, because actually this is not an interview. We're going to have a conversation, you and I, right? Yep. And so if you have questions yourself, Mike, ask me questions. and. We could share a story, but I, as I'm kind of the host by default, I would like to uh, give you the floor first. So uh, for you, uh, your experience, uh, could you tell us about like, how do you actually uh, found business agility? What What's your journey towards or your path uh, from uh, the agility itself to that revolution of business agility that uh, our mentor was part of it and how did you meet? Something like that. Well, yeah, I, I, I think of it as uh, I'll tell you my biases. <laughs> the, the places, the places I think I learned things, and uh, the the shapes that it it uh, made in in my brain. Um, I uh, I started out um, pretty much right out of undergrad, almost right out of undergrad. I was in, in business school, so I was trained as a finance guy. And uh, some other things, but mostly the, the numbers and the analysis and all that. And then I, I did a job uh, running big projects and, and crunching numbers for hospitals. Um, and after just a couple of years of that, I've, I'd been working with Outward Bound in Chicago. And I left my job and went off to lead wilderness courses in the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. And when I came back from that, I, I started out on a way to, to put together the adventure and the exploration and the uncertainty. And um, I mean, you talk VUCA, it's all there when you put stuff on your back and walk into the woods <laughs> or paddle into the lake, you know, you, you're living it. And so I wanted to take those experiences, expeditionary learning, and put it together with getting stuff done and making the numbers pencil out and, and making it work in a business sense. So uh, I started doing team building things with uh, Outward Balance corporate programs. And I did uh, um, some other things, set up some self-managed teams and, and learned how to do that from some, some folks who had really kind of invented it um, after World War II and uh, in the Welsh coal mines and other places around the world. So. I, uh, I had this history of, of self-managed teams, and then I got into open space, which is sort of pure self-organization. And so I knew that, that great things could happen if you didn't impose too much on the situation. You just said, okay, we, we need to get up that hill or across this lake or whatever. Um, we need to figure out the future of the business. And if we make a space for it, it could happen. The people could do it if we just got out of the way, right? 
And so I, uh, I got in this organization development track and I, I uh, started telling stories about inviting. And uh, uh, Daniel Mezik came around and said, hey, tell me about this. And then he went off and wrote a book about it and came back and told me more about it. And eventually he helped get me trained up as a, a scrum master. Uh, well, he, he taught me all the, all the language, right? All the, all the buzzwords. And along the way, I had introduced the Agile community to open space at the Agile XP universe in 2002. And I had facilitated things for the Agile Alliance board. And so I was making these connections between Agile and open space. Uh, but, uh, you know, Daniel did his work and, and sort of, you know, I, I had a, some papers and things on inviting and he sort of made a flag and, and created a, a movement with it. And, uh, so he taught me all the words and then I, I, uh, uh, ended up getting a job as a scrum master and they thought the people who were hiring me thought that I might need a CSM. Just oh. to make sure that I didn't get rejected by the client. Oh. And the closest CSM class to me in the very next week was Mike Beadle. And it was just luck that I showed up and Mike yeah. taught and me how to be a scrum master. We talk of the early 2000s, you said, like, or was it a bit off? Oh, no, this, uh, I mean, I did, I introduced Agile and Open Space when Agile was starting in 2002 in the conference. The Ag that was the first Agile Alliance conference. And that was, um, well, I mean, it wasn't even the Agile Alliance yet. And it was 300 people. And so we did an open space track on the future of software. And that was all the stuff that, that was all the uncertainty, right? That was the, um, the stuff that um, nobody knew what was going to happen next, you know? Yeah. They had all the, you know, so, so somebody knew all those things. Don't you feel that the last 20 years, uh, even since the manifesto, it's it's only like we are fighting buka every time, everywhere with all size of business or any kind of idea. Things are good. I'm not saying it's not good because we don't have to see it polarizing into negative or positive. Uh, but the thing is, it seems like since the uh, the end of the Cold War, even though like uh, 10 years before uh, the 2000s, it's not like the, the, the last three decades, it's only VUCA. We are right now in 2020 with a kind of a it's, VUCA on steroids. So, yeah, yeah, you know, the, the folks who did the work in the coal mines and, and um, developed this, they, they developed this very elegant way of moving from hierarchy to self-organization. They did it in two days with, with you know, relatively large groups would stand up multiple teams, and they had a very uh, careful process, a way to do that. But uh, they described four environments. And I'll skip ahead. The last one, the last of the four, they just called turbulence. Mm. Because it, it didn't, you know, the, the early, you know, the, the second one was about patterns. And the third one was about competition. So I learned to, you know, the, the, the patterns means, oh, if I see a tree that looks like that, there are probably bananas underneath it. That's a pattern. Now I can look for that tree and find the bananas. But when I pile up the bananas in a big pile and I start eating them and then I come back and I notice somebody's been eating on the other side of the pile. Now I'm moving into the other environment. That's competitive. But when people start hiding the, you know, taking the bananas and hiding them and the animals start taking them and everything's moving and the bananas, you don't know where the bananas are coming from anymore. That's turbulence. <laughs> so, turbulence. So that's the, um, the environment these guys describe. And that's what we tend to live in. I think uh, Peter Vale um, called it permanent whitewater, but he did that in like the 80s, the 70s. I don't know when he wrote that book. Did you say Peter Drucker? Uh, Peter Vale. Peter Vale. Uh, wrote a book uh, called something about permanent whitewater. And that, that's to me, that's the image of this turbulence. It always you know, somehow involves water. Um, but so, but again, I think like th those who are like very capable people are those who actually always see, always trying something, experimenting something. Like yeah. your Batman's example. Like, so if, if 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 you keep doing something and you don't have results, maybe you have to change the way you do it. 
No, it's not what I guess. Yeah. So, so is it not like that kind of mindset that make us being agile compared to all of those who said they do agile and you bring up the, the certification type of thing? Is it because yeah. we, are, we find that we suddenly expert as the agile manifesto will tell us there's no expert, it's just only people together cross-functional towards a goal? So, right. And the certification started, uh, that's actually the hurdle that I could get over because I could, you know, I could plug in my, my money and my, my name and then Mike would let me in his class the next week, right? But I did 2016. I had, now I came in knowing something about self-organization and I had set up self-managed teams in this, in this uh, participative design uh, process in 1995. So I knew something about what we were aiming for with Scrum. I knew how it worked. And I'd been facilitating open space. So, I mean, sometimes the, the, the people who are, are real hung up about what Agile is and certifications and things, sometimes they get a little fussy with me, uh, uh, upset, because I say Agile and open space are same. We put all the most important stuff on the wall, and then we get it done, right? But when I facilitated in 2002, and even in 2008, when I did an open space, I think it was the first scrum gathering that had an open space component, uh, was also in Chicago. And I was talking to people then about, hey, how do I get into this? I'm so close. You guys are doing, I mean, when I met the guys, uh, Chet Hendrickson and, and uh, Ann Anderson, who, who hired me to do the open space at the Agile XP uh, conference, I showed up at the hotel where it was going to happen. I said, okay, guys, tell me what you do. And, you know, tell me how this works. And they told me about Agile and Kanban and Scrum and you know, these methods and stuff and how they did stuff. And I just started laughing. I said, you guys are making software in open space. Yeah. And it took me like more than 10 years to get in and be allowed as a non-technology person, a non-software developer to be allowed into the club. So, how did you get in the club? Who, me? Yeah. That, that's the thing. Yeah. Me, actually, those engineers, those God programmers, you know, those guru of, oh, we are creating scripts and code and languages, and because of us, you have a product, and because of us, you know, and you, the CX. And you UX couldn't designer. possibly understand what we do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the other thing. Uh, until I took a class on, well, it was PHP for me back then to, to learn a bit of, of those code and on Symfony framework. I don't know if you, and, um, I, played I, was, on it. I was, I played was, with other stuff. Yeah. Because I was like, often like not pissed because I understand these kind of egos and stuff. But the funny thing is they asked me, I was a, a customer experience designer and also what's coming more and more back then, the user experience and the UI stuff and everything. And they said to me, like, no, 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 these projects, if we continue this type of waterfall or water scrum fall, because that was the funny thing, and those corporations I work with, uh, they said, like, Agile or Lean will be only for the development uh, or the production uh, part of our organization. And I find it very funny, because if, if procurement, if finance, if marketing are not even to the Agile, as you mentioned, the open space, making everything visual for everyone, uh, to understand the goal and vision. So uh, what the heck, a bunch of engineers uh, will, will work on Scrum, but that's a pressure type of project management. There's nothing new there. And unfortunately, even nowadays, there, I know a lot of, especially big corporations still, are still function on what I call water Scrum fall. I'm not the first one to make that name up. But, but again, all those frameworks are nothing if nobody is agreeing about it is are we doing this for people first? So me, that was very funny that all of those guru of programming who are building actually um, simulation software for uh, the Canadian Space Agency. I was in that context, okay? Uh, so for me, I was often talking with pilots or, or people to understand what they will need yeah. as a software, of, uh, as a training software to our simulation. And uh, all of a sudden, they said, like, and they want to make me a project uh, project manager. Yes, not even a product manager will have been better. Right. And, and I said no to that. I will keep to be the CX manager, you know, the customer experience manager. But all of a sudden, uh, the, the, they 
two, three engineer came with me. We had a cafe, a coffee somewhere. And I said, like, you know, uh, you have a loud mouth. You're pretty organized. You could facilitate stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we see you being our scrum master. I said, I said what? I, I thought they talked at Toastmaster. You know, those guys who are good at scrum. Right. They just told me that I had a lot something to do with standing up and talking. Okay. Yeah. I said, like, uh, so what's the purpose? I said, no, no, no. It's the scrum system from Jeff Shutterland and they, they dropped me a couple of names and they give me a book of Mike Beadle and Ken Schrober, actually. Yeah. Uh, as Agile Software. First book on Scrum. Yeah. I should have brought it with me. So this is the first literature I read in, in my journey to Scrum, Lean, and Agile. That was the book from Ken Schrober and, uh, and Mike Beadle. And then from there, I started experimenting with uh, one team. And I remember we used to hide ourselves from management to do that. <laughs> they thought I was the project manager doing a regular waterfall project, but I'm, actually we were doing experimenting with iteration. And actually, we had a wall with probably we were doing open space without doing it. I don't know because I I, I said to the uh, and there were no name back then. Like uh, well, me, I was the Scrum master, and I used to say this whatever. But uh, there were no product owner yet. There were no backlog. There were no sprint. We used the word iteration back then. Uh, what what just, time frame? What year was this? Oh, that was uh, 2002, something. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Right. Right. So uh, of course, Scrum was there where before, but um, I, uh, I I just knew about lean thinking management back then. But when you're on the business side, you you especially 20 years ago, we kind of care less about all of these uh, buzzwords. Right, right. We have our other buzzword with uh, customer relation management, with uh, what have you, the satisfaction of client, the sales pitch, and what have you. But uh, yeah, so I've been introduced to it, and other people always think like I'm an IT guy. I'm not an IT guy. I'm uh, I'm just like an organizer, a well public relation guy, and uh, and I like to facilitate and help people. I'm a coach also. I was coaching sports and, and bicycle team. So, you know, nowadays you said the Scrum Master. What is a Scrum Master? You should be a master of Scrum. So it means like back in 2002, that was wrong to, for me to have the title of Scrum Master because I was learning it with the guy. No. Uh, so how do you, so I was a team coach. If we simplify the language, I was a team coach. Right. And, uh, and then the coach Agile is the same thing. How much of you are in the mindset of Agile to proclaim yourself an Agile coach? So that's uh, another question too. Well, this you uh, it's you know there there's uh, when we talk in in open space and well, let me mention one other, one thing before I go there. Um, when when Mike brought out Enterprise Scrum, it was a couple of years after uh, he and I had done. My scrum training, you know, he had, he had knighted me as a scrum master, and uh, he invited me to come to the the training, and so he he taught us for for he taught two classes that week. I went to both of them: the software scaling and the and the business agility. And somewhere along the way, he and I got to talking about because uh, I, I was curious, and he he was very interested in open space, and he he didn't see any division, any any line between open space and enterprise scrum. And that was what I thought was so cool. So he uh uh we had this this conversation um a couple of times and it never resolved and it didn't have to. It, it, it the answer doesn't matter. The the question itself is the fun part, right? Because yeah. what I asked him and again not really looking for an answer um but I said I'm trying to figure out, it just in my own mind, is Enterprise Scrum one big open space with 9, 10, 12 boxes on the wall to just organize it? Or is it 9, 10, 12 individual open spaces hmm. where we deal with all the issues and opportunities for resources and all the issues and opportunities for customer and for leadership and you know these other... Parts. So, um, 
the, the fun thing is that we never decided, but we agreed that it was open space. That because Mike used to say, um, well, he was in one of the classes, I went to, I don't know, about 10 classes, I think, that he taught in Chicago. Every time he taught in Chicago, he'd have me come back and I'd help teach a little and I'd learn more stuff from him. And um, he, one of the early times he was, he used to give us the, the exercise and then leave, which is just what we do in open space. We say, okay, here's the markers, here's the paper. We all go, it all goes up on the wall. And then when we send people to the wall to figure out what they're going to do, which breakout sessions are going to go, the book says, go take a nap, leave, let them work it out. Right? So Mike used to do that very mm -hmm. naturally and he'd leave. And so he left us for 20 minutes and we were supposed to put stuff up on a canvas. And there are a bunch of us in the room and we're all puzzling and he's, he's told us all kinds of stuff and we're all kind of making it complicated. And um, he comes back and he looks at the wall and there's not a single sticky on the canvas. And oh, yes. we're all talking and there's sort of people are playing with the things and he's like, he picks up the paper that he'd given us the, the, uh, the canvas, uh, you know, was all on the you know, papers as well. And he's like, guys, guys, it's just a canvas. <laughs> Don't make it so complicated. And in these iterations with Mike and watching people learn this stuff, I, I distilled open space and Scrum and Kanban and, and then Enterprise Scrum all into the same model, the, the slightly bigger version of this put it all up on the wall and then get it done. Yeah. And it's that um, there's a, a, what Mike used to say is the canvas was for visualizing everything. Yeah. And when, uh, when you put everything up on the wall, like we've done, so, you know, I'd, I'd seen many, many times in open space, I've seen in Enterprise Scrum since, um, that to me, when we talk in open space, that when we say, okay, here's the story, here's what we're here for, now here's the markers and the paper, and there's the empty wall. That's the, the sacred moment, Harrison Owen calls it, that, you know, when nobody knows what's going to happen. The whole next thing, the whole way we're going to be is born out of that void. Right? <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, and he studied, Harrison studied, you know, biblical stories and stuff i mean if he didn't you know whatever ancient greek and all that and so he came at it from a spirit standpoint but it's really true and before you put anything on the wall anything can happen and as soon as you start naming things you are creating the future you are creating your world and you know you can do that with a regular scrum backlog or you know whatever. That, that, is but, very, that is very power, powerful mike my, so my... that's the key moment yeah once you get everything on the wall, I go back to my own experience with personal Kanban. The first time I did this visualization for myself, I did it in my living room, sitting in front of the fireplace with a whiteboard leaned up, and I, I put up everything I could think of doing in my life. Everything I thought I had to do, and, and it was not bucket list stuff. I mean, it's just like the stuff that I was working on. And it was simultaneously um a relief and a horror uh, you know or whatever it was it was overwhelming and i didn't need to carry it around anymore but so there's this oh shit moment of what do i do with this right you have a whole shit moment and i have fuck up moment <laughs> yeah so kind of as soon as the stuff goes up on the wall though the rest is completely natural yeah oh shit what do i do with this yeah. well do These like, go together. This yeah. goes together. Okay, what do we do? What, this is most important. This can't happen yet. We sort it out. We prioritize. And where there are big things, we break them into small things. All this happens naturally. Then, yeah, I, was I was going to ask you. I was yeah. going to ask you because when you said like, uh, because for me, every year, okay, when I start my new year for my mini companies, I'm actually doing like an open space. So I call it a vision board in my case because I'd like to see what is my mind, my mind and my heart as well. Mm. So I put it on a big wall of paper with circles and I create a kind of a galaxy of it. But sometimes 
hmm, I caught myself doing the reverse splitting of probably an idea. I clustered them <laughs> together instead. So this, this is not good. I said like, okay, if I cluster them with them, so probably I have to prioritize a couple of those ideas into more specific action. So, so when you said like, I have to split yeah. it uh, into a shorter feasible thing, to digest yeah. along the way, depending on the cycle, you know. I mean, and, and it's a process of, you say, well, if I'm going to clean up this board, that thing either has to get done or it has to get tossed, Yeah. right? And if I'm not going to toss it and I can't do it as it is, then I have to break it down. So we can write books about refinement, but... It's a natural thing, right? Yes. And then if I find the things that are most important and I move them over to one side, I don't care which, or the top or whatever, now I know what I have to do tomorrow. And I can ignore the rest. So and this, is so this right. happens. So then I commit to those things. Then I can actually get them done. And then the last piece of this story is that when, when we were kids and we played football in the front yard, of the, the neighbor kid's yard because it was perfect rectangle. After every play, we went back and the huddle was, how come you didn't hit me? Well, I didn't see you. Yeah, but I was doing this. And that's a retrospective, right? Kids do, like everybody does, you know, the, 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 the tower of blocks falls down and the kids, first they cry and then they're like, why? What happened? Well, let's try it again. And they, they, they're trying it different and trying to do it better. And yeah. so retrospective, the, the, the prioritization and the, the, all that uh, you know, refining and, and committing and delivering and ret what Mike called, I, I love, when he went away from retrospective and called it review and improve because it gave it purpose. It gave it forward focus. Um, when uh, those things are all natural phenomena, as long as you can get over the hump of putting everything you know on the wall and by, you know, corollary or whatever, uh, everything you don't know. And because that was the horror part of looking at the, the um, board when I first did it was, oh my, first it was, oh my God, that's a lot to do. And then I stood back and said, wait, is that all I am? That's all I'm about is what's... My whole life's work, everything that I think I could be and do is on this one little, now they were very small stickies, but it was not a huge whiteboard either. And it was like, oh my God, that's my life. That's the whole thing. So well, anyway, that's, that's the, the danger of putting all this stuff on the wall. Yes and no. It's not a danger, but actually well, life is dangerous. It's an experiment. It feels that way though. I like it, I like it Mike, that you brought it up because I, I, I don't think there's there's not enough of us and if we are a community of agile or business agilists, a lot of people, as you said, like they talk about literature, they talk about uh, Harvard Business Review uh, type of thing. And I said like, all of a sudden, like since when the lean and agile people are complicating things with intellectual type of stuff as actually we should go with the flow of experimenting and prison. Like the kids we were playing football, as you mentioned, I like that example. And because and that's it's it's for any game actually. I remember like uh, so as I, I mean that this is like so in your face in nature. And we have the tendency of being those uh, smart monkeys. I don't know if you remember the the great botanist Terence McKenna. I don't uh, want to. I know the name. I don't. He, 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 so, so for him, he was a botanist and he worked for big pharma to, to find plants in the South America. But at some point, he, by meeting a lot of people, by meeting other ideas and, and reevaluating the, the conception of our Northern and Western civilization, of, he, 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 he worded, one of his first book out of the botanic <laughs> was actually The Monkey Who, think, who Thinks, something like that. So, so then he went about the, the psychedelic monkeys and so, and so on and so on. So, so that was like kind of, that was like crazy, the shit at the fan moment for him saying like, we are in academia, even business school, 
complicating thing that are in our face and we just have to flow with it. And we often talk in Kanban or some other kind of post-work framework. Of the well, and we do it to ourselves. It's not yeah. just the guys who are inventing the things and studying the things. As consumers of learning, we, we want to go right to the mastery. We don't want to, I think what, what we need to understand, um, I like the word in, in, in the coding community, the craftsmanship mm. term was really, I think, right on. We don't understand practice. Um, having, having been introduced to some uh, you know, Tibetan guys and, and um, learned some things about meditation and all, and, and uh, you know, they have, uh, you know, they have lineage is the other thing we don't, you know. I learned Scrum and Enterprise Scrum from Mike Beadle. Who helped invent it? You know, I mean, there's, there's like, there's, but he would say, he learned Scrum from Jeff. Yeah, he started out. He started out all his class. You know, his enterprise Scrum class said, "Look, I took and made this from what I got from Jeff and Ken." That's you know, so he introduced lineage there, and yeah. we we want to go straight to the the mastery. So we we say, "Give me, tell me everything you know." And you say, oh, my God, I've been doing this for, you know, 10, 15, 5, 20 years, whatever, long time. Anyway, many times. So what I've learned. Whereas, you know, and Mike, I mean, I, I was pushing on him a bit about this because he had come up with 22 canvases, I think, at last count. And I, I thought it was 35. But said, What's that? I thought it was 35 at some point. I don't know. It was it was many. It was more than I could count. Because right? I remember last time I met with him in New York uh, in 2018, actually, just prior to him uh, departure. Yeah. He was asking me about, um, uh, with the, that girl also from Moscow, Marina Alex, who did the yeah. Sway stuff, you know? So he said, like, oh, so, so we might do a canvas on customer experience, like Alex Alm is kind of doing. And and we're talking about the human resources for Agile. That was just prior to the business agility summit. Oh, yeah. And so I think he created on the spot there in New York three more canvases. One for oh, HR and they, they happen. So, yeah. And they th there was compliance and marketing yeah. and sales and everything. But I said yeah, but to him, Mike. Because don't laugh. This is a, his way of managing perception. It was great. This is what I learned from him when we had entering a meeting with VPs and so on. Like he said, like, Shut up and listen, and you'll see. I will take that canvases. I will change the name just to appeal to that guy. Yeah. So at some point, like maybe yeah, that was the, but that was important because you know the compliance you're talking about, that's helping me and save my butts and save my clients' butts and the financial institution so much yeah. because when they no, see it, like yes, but we just have that he had so many of them, right? I know, but actually, it's not. It's not like a box tool of things. Like if you well, need the well, canvas, this is this is what I. This is what I was trying to tell him when I first heard, you know, when I first encountered this is I don't think, because I came from Outward Bound and experiential education, right? <laughs> we used to take people into the woods and on the first night, they would pull out tents. We hadn't practiced. You know, it's going to get dark. They need a place to sleep. Yeah. They're going to figure it out. If they don't figure out tonight, they're going to be there tomorrow faster so they have more daylight to figure out how the heck these things go together, right? But they need to learn for themselves. We'll learn to, to do fire first and then yeah. something that so, you ask me. So I told him, Mike, I, I'm really I'm concerned that, that you take some of the experience, some of the learning experience away from, from folks. They need to, that they don't understand their canvas. So I couldn't, I mean, I could understand all these canvases, but I couldn't, um, when, when he died, and I tried to represent what I'd learned from him and what he was teaching in his classes, um, I couldn't explain 20 or 30 canvases. So I distilled them all. And most of them collapsed into one form, one basic form. And there were three centers, three primary value lists that I call the day job, the stuff we get paid for. And 
Then all the other boxes around it are all the different things that we have to do in order to do that work. And that's, you can tweak the labels, um, the leadership, you know, there, there's a box out on the, the far left of the canvas. I think the original business model canvas called it suppliers. Mm -hmm. It's basically the, the inputs you got to work with. It's the boundaries, right? But I've called it alternatively context, leadership, um, governance, funding. When I was teaching it, uh, I, I taught enterprise scrum to single software teams in, uh, in a financial business. And for them, it was regulatory was part of that. It's all the boundaries that get put on our work that we have to work within. So you can tweak the names, but the basic shape of the thing is the same. And there's a, in my view, there's a, there's a, uh, an environment frame that is that leadership context governance piece, purpose, customer, and metrics. That's all what it looks like on the outside. Then there's a frame that's the inside, the system. It's our resources that we can tap. It's team practices. It's the roles, the, the scrum board itself that we need to maintain, stakeholders, channels. That's all the stuff that we need inside our system to do the work. And that distinction between environment and system is something I learned from Emory and Trist, the guys who did the self-organizing stuff and described those environments, the turbulent and all that. That's their language coming but, in socio-technical systems in the 1950s or something. That old? Really? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that was... Yeah. Right. And the interesting thing is the, the socio-technical systems and the Emory and Trist work, when they went into the coal mines, Incidentally, they went in because they had brought all this automation into the mines and they had destroyed the teams that had gone in together and kept each other alive. Now every man went in individually and they were trying to overcome and rebuild the, the teams that kept people sane and safe in the mines. So um, it was very much a, a people first you know, let's, let's look out for these guys who are going and dig, dig in the coal. Um, so anyway, I simplified Mike's canvases to one that mm -hmm. has three different ways to, to plug in. And one of them is the, the, the portfolio version of his canvases. And the other is the uh, scaling with the columns. And uh, then there's sort of a blank and you can make up your own. But those are my three. And then just the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, somebody, a group I was working with, they said, oh, no, the canvas is too complicated, and I'm, people are going to be confused. And I said, oh, you know, people are really thinking it's not that confusing, right? It's not. So I simplified it to this. I don't know if we... So this I is only two of those on YouTube and Facebook? because This those is two boxes. Confused. Yeah, I simplified, you know, about a dozen, uh, you know, business model canvas inspired panels oh, to these two. Be, yeah. Okay. Everything we need to do and all the reason we can't. Why we can't. Because so, everything is possible, right? No. Well, well yeah. No? yeah. Yes. We know that, but they don't know it yet. Okay. So we say, look, tell me all the stuff you got to do. And then, well, why don't you just go do it? Well, because this depends on that, and we're waiting for this. No, that's and the thing. So that's all the obstacles. Yeah, but right? that, exactly. So you actually list up front. Well, what obstacles are, even sure. before practicing the cycle of performing. Because it's what they know. Right? Really? It's, but, and with that, uh, see, because what are resources? What um, Resources in the canvas are those things, people and tools and things that we don't have in the team that we have access to. We can call in this specialist or we yeah. can, you know, use these things. Those things are usually uh, when teams bring an obstacle to say, well, we don't know how to do this. And they say, well, where are you going to find? It? So we'll get you a resource. Okay. Well, so a lot of those systems, a lot, a lot of the stuff that's wrapped around the PVL <laughs> Yeah. is the stuff that we got to do to overcome the, the obstacles anyway. So they're already talking in that language. 
But, but for me, you know, the, 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 the means, like we talk about business model canvases, like uh, I could see, I could, I will play the devil advocates a little bit here. Like there was a, like, I could hear people like, I don't know about the seven, 10 people who are watching right now, but are we oversimplifying things? Because for me, what I do is, of course, I found that creating a canvases with a label on it for anything of aspect. Oh. But the, I, a, generic, a generic one, hold on, a generic one, and then you probably draw or created boxes needed for a specific context. This is my signature pattern. Like the same thing with the Jeff Shutterland Scrum Inc. Uh, kind of uh, building team canvases, you know, to, to create a, a team working agreement. I like to use it because more often when you introduce people to Scrum and Agility, they, they don't want to go into a blank pages. So, but I tell them, okay, you see, this is a model for you to have your structure of your team with uh, the ceremony you choose, the stuff. But actually, if you want to remove a box from that canvases, be my guest. If you'd like to add the box, be my guest. This is fully configurable. Uh, configu uh, yeah, configurable. <laughs> configurable, thank you. And I just want to mention that we have a couple of Europeans making likes on Facebook, Michael. And Excellent. Oh, we have Barbara Michur. She was there. I don't know, Barbara, if you're still there, say hello to us because I see your art. You just make us a like. So I'm glad you you make it. So Barbara, she was listening to us at some point. Well, so we're we're going in the same direction. Yeah. And um, who? And this, I fully expect these two boxes to do what my first personal Kanban did to explode. Exactly. Right? So they blow these up and they say, "Oh, geez, we've got three different things that we have to do, and we've got these six different kinds of obstacles." Well, look, guys, I wonder if those match up with these things I've gotten, this, you know, these labels on this canvas. Oh, yeah. Well, so now they can see how they do it. Um, you know what I like of your can't do, Colin, is actually it will show up right off the bat to the organization. And this is, for me, the true experimentation of business agility, showing like our team would like to avoid the water scrum fall. Because if those impediments is because of X department that don't want to change the way they finance our project, for example, or they don't want to um, refactor the way they do testing or what have you, all the cons, I like it that way because this, is, this could even be the assessment of, are you ready to be agile or not? That's well, are you really awesome. ready? To, are you ready to deliver it? I mean, I don't yeah. think it has anything to do with being agile. Because you're either going to let those stop you Voila. or you're going to produce something. Exactly. Right? So every, this is why I, I mean, this is the simplified version of there's all the work we do that's our day job that customers think they pay us for. But then, I mean, we need a team. Okay. Well, we've got four guys. We need five. So somebody's got to write a job description. Somebody's got to go talk to the boss and get some budget. Somebody's got to set up some interviews. There's, there's, work there's stuff to do so, unless unless you start from scratch with a startup with all new guys who found the company they should know each other a little bit even the no, startup, there's you know, still there's still stuff to do yes they should they know what never there's right. never they they unless a group of guys stumbles upon boxes of bananas <laughs> sitting on the side of the street and they say guys let's open these and sell them to to people who walk by and you know if if it doesn't happen that easy, they're going to have to go get the bananas. They're going to have to decide which street corner to drop them on. They're going to have to decide how many. There are all kinds of decisions. Then they're going to have to decide who's going to carry them from the car, whose car they're going to drive. There are all kinds of decisions to be made. And those all show up on the board as things we need to consider. Because if it's not as obvious as, hey, here they are. Let's sell them and make money. Um, then then they don't have it all worked out. So this then is how I come at this kind of naturally. Incidentally, there's there's another thing that, that we invented along the way in the in the trainings. Um, sometimes looking at the canvas is intimidating. And part of it is they don't know if they want their brains to go into that shape. And that's fair. 
you know, I bring out a set of clothes and say, hey, try these on. You say, yeah, eh, not my style. You know, so they don't know if it's their style. But yeah. what what we've done. Why don't we create your style? Why don't we create together your style? Yeah. So, well, one of the ways that we've tested this is I say, look, I know this form is pretty good. It, it, there's a lot of stuff been fit into this. Um, you know, between Mike's testing and my own experience with it, I feel pretty good about going back to Alex Osterwalder and, and all the people who've used business model canvas. It's a pretty robust story to start with or, or vessel uh, framework to start with. Um, so I know this, but you know your work. So let's do an experiment. Take the last six months of work. Let's create the done canvas first. I mean, the enterprise scrum scrum board is a to do canvas and a little Kanban for the for the cycle, and then uh, a done canvas, right? So let's populate the done canvas with what you've done the last six months, or pick a you know pick a time frame. This way, they know the work, but they don't know the canvas. Mm -hmm. Now they can learn the canvas with no question about what the work means. What is it? Now, when I say, okay guys, now what do you want to do with the next six months? They don't have to learn the canvas they already did. They're not walking into, geez, what is this canvas and what is our work? How do we add value? Do you have the perception that the, uh, the canvases were meant to be actually enforced into people to make everything visual or that was just an aid and they could actually do whatever they want like you just did actually you you just did that like, uh, yeah we, well simplifying that well i think um well mike talked in those earliest days when i was with him in the first uh enterprise scrum trainings he was hoping to be able to create software where People could put answers to questions and stuff would show up on canvases. So I think I think he was pretty committed to the canvas. Um, but I think the fitting, going back to the story I, I told earlier, I think the, the fitting of the canvas, the specific shape and you know the the rigor of the canvas isn't as important as the making that leap to visualizing exactly, exactly because it, it comes back to um, what mike uh, think and i think since the beginning of uh, trying to help uh, any business of any size is is the people first from even your example you said in the mining thought but even it should always be about our experience as people mm. and making everything visual then after all the tool all the framework all the literature, all the what have you, it's could be important after if you'd like to leave a trace or to leave a kind of tip because that's a bit like of the cycle of thing, you know. Like uh, I, I like to to use these uh, analogy of the uh, martial art type of thing, like uh, with your master, the shuhari. Huh? In the mm. shu moment, you do like the kids on the playground, you experiment things and this stuff. Like, and then you learn that if you do it that certain way, you have certain results. And because you have those results that everybody wants, apparently, just saying, then you will repeat it and you will improve it because you'd like to have may maybe better or smarter results. And then you come to mastering it and teach it to others. So maybe I'm simplifying it, but I think you understand my point. So mm. for me, whether it's the canvases from Enterprise Scrum or the... Um, these big circle, I don't remember the name from uh, another framework or uh, these big complicated safe things of, uh, you know, organigram or so. So at the end of the day, consultant or not, if, if, if your appeal to a certain audience or certain people, they, want, is they are just tools. Because as you said, could we right. get the S done? That's the important thing. So for me, this is why more and more, Michael, I, I try to stay away, and I don't mind to say it, apply it here to anyone who will, or any market, 
This is why I, stay, I try to stay away from these big corporate toxic politics that just want to have tools and buzzword and mm. certification and apparent expertise of doing things because they don't move. They will hide themselves into those canvases actually or anything. And it became just toxic politics instead of doing things that brings value to their well, clients, for example. And you can, you know, in that same way, um, the other story I tell about these different methods is that I know that if we write an invitation inside, especially inside of an organization where people care so much because they're working on stuff every day, it's not mm -hmm. some community thing, it's not a conference, but if you do open space inside of an organization and you say, we're going to talk about the future of the organization and you're welcome to come and learn and contribute in that, people will come. Yes. And when you set the chairs up and you say, okay, we don't have a, an agenda, you do this in open space, and you say, anything that you think matters to the future of this company, you write it on the paper and put it on the wall. You will identify all the issues that matter. You will get them addressed in breakout conversations to the extent that anybody in the room knows how to do that at that moment. You can take the notes. You can ask them to take notes, and they will. And then you can share the notes around. You can prioritize those. and create action plans, immediate next steps for those um, issues. Now, a lot of times, the thing to do is to go back to the office and go back to work the way we always uh, have worked. But if you leave all that stuff up and start moving it, you know, prior, you know you prioritize a bit, and which is natural, I would maintain, and you move that over, to a, another panel of the wall, and then when you finish things, you move them over, you can easily invent Kanban. Now, if you have to do some more refining, if you need to, you know, somebody walks up to the wall and says, hey, this thing here, when is it gonna get done? Well, most simple Kanbans can't answer that question. Yeah. Unless you've gotten really into the analysis there, but. Otherwise, I think that just sort of leads you into Scrum, where you start to, you know, look at velocity and look at the the effort it's going to take, the complexity um, of things, and and what it's going to take to come over that, how fast you're chewing through this pile, and you're going to have to invent Scrum out of your Kanban. And then, if you do that with very many teams, and you have very big things going on, working on the same thing, you're scaling or you're you're connecting multiple teams. You're gonna have to invent enterprise Scrum anyway, so all of that naturally happens, yeah. and the proof that open space and and that whole journey to, to enterprise Scrum is possible was was made for me when I worked with a, a community art center called the Art Barn, in Michigan City, Indiana. I volunteered to to open a space on a, a Sunday because my mom is a watercolor artist and they needed some help. And I said, sure, I'll do this. So we worked in open space for a few hours, a couple hours, two, three hours. And then I gave them 20 minutes to take everything that was on their flip charts and put it in the canvas. And by God, they did it just like that. Now, they might, it, it might have been a, a stacked deck, so to speak, because they were, they were artists. They're used to doing their stuff and putting it on the wall. So maybe the mind was already ready to put stuff on the wall. But no matter, they didn't know anything about Scrum and Kanban. You know, like, but they managed to put that stuff up. They could prioritize in the boxes. And they took it and they put it in a spreadsheet. And that's how they ran the next uh, three, six, nine months of their you know, turning the place around. Uh, that, that, then I don't know what happened after that. But. You don't know what happened after that. But... Um... I mean, they're still there, but they, I mean, that, I mean, they, they had only talked about what, I mean, the open space was, let's get our act together in the next six months. There was a trigger to what you said before, like, uh, we create an open space and we invite everybody and they will come. Okay. What about those people who are not necessarily less creative, but they feel they're not that outgoing. They are more introvert. What do you do? Is it like because it's an open space? It's a, it's not an issue. It's it looks 
Tell me. No, because it. on the one hand, the people always start with, well, what about the intro? There's a big circle, and people have to announce things, and then they're, they're, everybody is moving around, and it looks like a big party, and the introverts would get lost. But I would, I mean, other than being an introvert, very strong introvert, I should say, and um, not really worrying about the extroverts because they always seem to take care of themselves. Um, so the introverts never ask this question. How do you identify introvert, extrovert? Me? Yeah. Oh, I identify as, uh, as a whole being, so I don't know. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, but truly, but, so if we all did that, then your question goes poof. But so that for the sake of your question. For the sake of my question, I will say mostly, uh, as I told, like, uh, I, I'm too loud, apparently. So, so probably if I'm too loud, I'm probably extrovert. You're probably an extrovert. Well, I feel the need another need... round for everybody. Okay. Oh, yeah. So well, here's the that's thing. That's a great, it's a great question because it's extroverts looking out for the introverts. The introverts never ask, hey, what about the, you know, we all go into the center of the circle and say, this is my burning passion. This is the most important thing to me. And I'd like to talk to a few of you who share this passion. And then the people who gather, I know they only came to talk about the issue that I posted. They're going to go deep into it with me. And I don't know what these extroverts do because they always just want to go around and buy another round of drinks and talk to everybody a little bit and find out what's going on at the next party. They never you know, want to go deep and, and really think deeply and feel deeply and you know all that, whatever. And um, how are they going to work in this open space setting where only the most important stuff is what we need to, to dive deep into? There's, so there's something for everybody in it. Okay, but again, I don't want to put like the temperament into it, but like uh, because I struggle often as a consultant to enable people and those who are less too loud uh, seems to to be harder to get and through this kind of creative process of making everything visual and transparent. I, I'm not saying like they want to hide or that's not what I'm saying, but. I mean, uh, at some yeah, point. I've never found the, the oh? when you when you make the currency in open space, you make the currency caring, oh. and nobody you know caring. You got different ways to express it, but everybody cares. So we're back to whole people. When Mike built this canvas, uh, adapted from the uh, business model canvas, he put purpose at the top. Now. Everybody's working on that. So introvert, extrovert, doesn't matter. Purposeful. The Emory, Emory and Trist in, in the coal mines and all that. And they used said, to say, they, they, they said all of that participative design work um, ran on two assumptions. People are purposeful and can be ideal seeking. Those two things, if you grant me those two things, Open space and enterprise scrum and everything in between is completely normal, explainable, natural, because people care about a purpose and you don't need to agree with their purpose, but they've got it and they care about it and they're going to chase it. So, so the force is a flow of letting go of what we learn together. Mm. Is it? Yeah. Because when I, when I hear you explaining this, from the open space to enterprise scrum and anything in between. For me, it's like the flow of a river through the ocean. No, I really, that's the way I feel it. I'm not thinking it, I'm just like, I'm feeling it. The water is always the water. If I play, if I pick up on this, um, there's always the water. The, the shapes, you know, it, it gets deep, it gets narrow, it gets wide and flat and shallow and slow. It's a different experience in different places, but the water is always the water. The purpose, the caring, the people, it's always, there's always a, a movement and energy. I mean, this VUCA, this stuff comes because people are always moving. Minds are always yeah. moving and, and things. So yeah, th that's the water. And then we, we run it through these containers all the way into, you know, glasses. I didn't bring beer, I, I'm bad. I drink water. 
we have I've got both. But actually, you know, again, water is everywhere. It's seventy percent of our planet of our body, and and beer there's water. It is. We got a couple of things, and we have fermented it for the alcohol. But I guess I'm a purist. <laughs> But the story I was telling just a minute ago would, would say otherwise. I don't know. I guess I'm a whole person, as you say. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, because for me, uh, the, the identification of uh, are you this, are you that? No. Uh, of course, we have enough in, uh, in kind of uh, helping people. You try to see, you adapt yourself or your style of coaching, for example, or stuff. So so for me, is uh, an open space. So I had to have that question because whether we do sometimes, you will never satisfy everybody, right? So I was questioning more, it was it like, how do you actually make sure that that space will be for everyone? Because the yeah. extrovert, the, 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 the standard extrovert, loud mouth could take too much space. So for me as a facilitator- and People I walk to, away. You, People walk that's away. The thing, that's the thing. And, so, and, and, they do, and they do what they need to do in their way, down the hall, in another, it, it and, Part of this is well, that, I, one answer to your question is you can't. You can't take care of it. We asked, this was, I always remember, the open space on open space four. The, the fourth one we did, this was 1996. And, uh, you know, we still get together. A lot of open space people get together every, every year and talk about open space. You know, we eat our own dog food, as they say. And uh, so we did this, and somebody put up a topic and said, uh, is, the question was, is open space safe space? Mm -hmm. And it was about creating safe space, and who does that? And one of the, the, the main conclusion, as I remember it, is that if the universe is, you know, going back to the Einstein thought, uh, you know, if the universe is, is cruel, then everything is dangerous, including open space. Yeah, and if we like, live in a benevolent universe. Life, life experience itself, here in this dimension, it's dangerous. Everything we, is sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's lions and tigers and you yeah. know, guys on the corner selling bananas and who knows where they came from. And and this is why apparently we become civilized because we try to, to construct the bubble. The control and control. And, right. Exactly. Well, that's that's pretty true. Yeah, I, I got to agree with that. And, and safer, yet, safer and safer, and sometimes safe. You can't. You, you lose your. How do you decide? Like, yeah, at the free there, will. No. You know, but the the conclusion that that always stuck with me was: if people think the world is safe, then they're going to think open space is safe. And if they think the world is dangerous for whatever reason, lions and tigers. Or the guy in the cube next to you who bullies you with paper clips and you know yeah. whatever stickies on your back or something you know whatever if, if there if there are jerks in the office they're going to be jerks in open space if you if you get together and talk about the future of the company so you can't in some ways if taking the organizational context for instance if we get open space together in open space. I think it's unreasonable to expect that anybody coming in as a facilitator or the boss or anybody else who would open and hold that space, it's unreasonable to hold them to a higher standard than we do every day. It can only be the world we live in. It's not separate from, it's not rarefied. It's just true. It's just real. And if the, if the office is a, cutthroat place then open space about the office is going to be cutthroat until people choose of somebody putting it up and saying um hey is there another way other than cutthroat office i mean we had a uh in an open space once we had a false choice created because they had a keynote speaker who talked about an issue that some people cared about and the other people were I mean, it was, is a food healthy or emergency food and homeless and, and soup kitchens and stuff? And he talked a lot about um, uh, organics and stuff like that, healthy food. And so there was this division created in the group artificially 
And somebody put up the topic the next day, of the, the beginning of the day, said, do hungry people care if, if it's healthy? Question. And started to cut through the, the false dichotomy. So people can raise issues like that in a way that cuts through that space if they want, when they dare. Um, and, and, so. and people just show up in the open space. Yeah. That's it. I mean, like, it's open. It's open for anyone who wants. To. Well, I mean, you convene. I mean, you say, look, we're going to, um, we're going to have this meeting. We've got 150 people we're inviting who said they, you know, signed up, said they're going to come. We're going to talk about the future of the business or whatever. Some smaller topic. Um, you could have all the potential stakeholders. Well, heck, there's a there was a group that used to do industrial design. I mean, they built software that mm -hmm. auto companies and Deer and Caterpillar used to build heavy equipment. My my buddy there um, used to say, "We we design design." <laughs> they he says, what we're we're inventing what the human mind can then use to make things that come into the world. So they were designing design, and they used to have. He was the vice president of space. He was the vice president, eventually. He was organization development, then strategic planning, then space was his portfolio. And he was the vice president of strategic planning and customer excellence. And he used to have an annual open space. They brought people in, a handful of people from their 13 or so largest clients. They did an open space with that. So it would have been a group of 50 or 60 people, maybe. And they identified, they, it was customers plus some people from the company, right? And oh. it was basically a stakeholder conference. Every year, their biggest customers designed what they wanted to see delivered a year from now. Well, so they didn't have to sell any of that. They only had to build it. So, so you can get that together and yeah, people show up and then they, they start writing stuff that they want to see and, and working out that they work out all the specs. I mean, so, so that means that the people interaction is fully open. And well, as open as the people choose. As the people moment choose. Moment to moment. As you said, like it will reflect the actual organization culture and so on. But what, we'll, you, you, you see, like big corporation, often they will do this kind of town hall where only a couple of stakeholders. I know, I know, that, that's the thing. So, so you will say, like, and the plan new, the scripts for months, and yes. Yeah, yeah. But there's no interaction there because you just right. receive information and you receive exactly what you're going to do into your department and this and that. Yep. So, actually, if we would like to really change the world of work instead of just talking about it, we should use open space at least once a year and create a vision altogether for those who do and those who actually they said they we hold. use it. we use it every we can use it every day right it um yeah, but i mean yeah you it, it, it doesn't because it, because it doesn't need to be the big event right yeah. the the big event of 140 people from all over the world with the ceo and the rest of the c suite and all that stuff that's one thing that can happen right okay but that's like the enterprise scrum map with with all the teams linked together you know like mike's vision yeah but nobody starts out there and you don't have to right i did an open space on a project team because we had a project meeting every week and the project manager was always invited or, or the boss of the project manager was always invited so we worked out the agenda I mean, there were like five people gathering, but the, the boss could come. So we had to have the typed agenda, and we had to work out the whole agenda for about two days out of every week. And then it got printed up, and everybody got passed out at the beginning of the meeting, and the project manager would run the meeting. And if the boss walked in, it would all be perfect, and we would be right on where we were supposed to be. And we went on like that for a couple of months and then we got to the place where the project manager asked us how we were how we were doing and it was a relatively short project about halfway through and none of us working on the project knew how we were going to get out of this thing alive 
because we weren't getting anywhere. All we were doing was making agendas. Did, so did, yeah, did I, I said, it? when she asked, how's it going in this little, you know, what some people would call a come to Jesus meeting. Um, the, uh, I said, you know, I wish just one, one of these weekly project team meetings, we could just make a list on the whiteboard of everything we need to do in order to get done. <laughs> just one of these boxes, right? Just, just by one box. Um, make the list of everything we need to do to get this done right by the time we, we said we're going to finish. And everything that other people said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Everything, everything that will prevent us because your second column. Is I didn't even, I didn't even ask the second question. No, Just honey. what do we need to do? Simplest backlog question possible, right? Yeah. To a group of five people plus the manager, maybe. And so I said, could we just make that list? And okay. she let us do that because the team was kind of fed up with her. Said, yeah, yeah, let's do, let's just do that because they, you know, it was a little, little pushback. So we did that. Now we put eight things up. We talked about two of them, right? Or three of them. The next week we got back together and we had a typed agenda again. But you know what? It looked exactly like what was on the wall. And we talked about it some more. And we went along and chewed through those things and got it done on time, on budget, on the mark. So that was a tiny bit of open space that opened and then it went boop, closed and got owned the same way it always did. But it, the river kept leaking through. It, 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 we just put the river in a pipe and put mm. it underground, but it kept flowing and we got done with it. But that's the thing. Like I, I see it often and to all, any type of group that become a real team that want to achieve something, this is what they do. Mm. And a lot of people from the outside will say, like, oh, these guys are oversimplifying things. I said, like, really? Is it not the purpose? We talked about the VUCA, volatility and complexity. Why? What do you want to hide behind your complexity, behind your processes, behind your procedure that become our list of impediments, actually? Mm. You let them do with self organized and self managed what they are there to do with their skills and competency. They will achieve it. But if you put them into a box of any type of uh, structure and procedure, you're killing the creativity and the possibility of doing the things that are important for all the yeah. stakeholders at some point. But question here. Yeah. It's really, really fun and open space. We're open. We're more creative. And we get the shit done probably faster because it's visual and and so on, but I have a but. I, I, I usually not go into the but, but just for the purpose of the discussion, I like to, because I could hear Start people. Start up, baby. Yeah. What about the consensus? Do we have to be consensual and uh, abiding to a, a kind of a group eye mindset, or we could still allow a type of a free will or a type of a kind of a out of the box inside that out of the box type of thing? Well, it's another. You know I, mean? I think the I think the question implies another kind of container. Another, another it's just what? another consensus. It's just another container. Because That's, what if we whether we get consensus or we don't? Is it when we say that? Is it on everything? Is it on some things? Does it include what should we get on the pizzas for lunch on Friday? Um, you know, yeah, we work in perfect consensus until we got to order the pizzas, and then it's free for all, <laughs> right? But I know um, well, because so. It doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Whether we achieve that doesn't matter. What matters is that, go, go back to the manifesto, the people in the, the interactions, if they're talking to each other. Exactly. I mean, Marilyn Emery, who, Fred Emery's wife, who taught me this participative design, she, um, pe people asked her about using this, these methods at, uh, I think it was, uh, well, I won't say the name of the company in case I get it wrong, but there was a company that was raised by name in the in the training. And the problem was, well, what if I do it there where they've done, they've created stuff um, for torture. They're, they're creating tools for torture. And she looked at this person, and Marilyn is, stands about 4'10", but she's 
just a giant energy and uh, 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 just a firecracker. And she looked with, with it grew up in the outback or something. I mean, she was just, she was tough. And she says, she, she turned on the person and said, how are they going to change if we won't work with them? <laughs> I said, You're right. Yeah. How, unless we see something different. So as long as people are talking about this stuff, as long as they have to put all their stuff on the wall together, because there's one wall, they, if there's two then, walls, they don't have to talk to each other. With the conversation and interaction, we could actually kind of... Something will happen. Flowing. Because what I uh, sometimes, uh, and just want to stick into the open space, but any kind of gathering of people try to work together, when you have someone in the room start saying like, oh, when and should we agree? Agree on what? We should, ag we should agree that everybody should put up their topic. Well, here's the other thing. People say, oh, you sit in the circle in open space. That's because everybody is equal. And exactly. I always push back. I say, no, the people are all still very different. They mm -hmm. all come, they have different preferences. They have different experiences, different tools and skills. But they all have the same job. Everybody has to learn and contribute as much as they can. And everybody has to figure out what that means for themselves. Only they know. And only they can push that edge. That's their personal expedition. But we can all travel that so, same so journey. A lot of people think that because they are in a circle, it's because everyone is equal. Yeah. They have equal access. We set the markers in the center. And everybody has equal access to the tools. Mm -hmm. Everybody has equal access to the wall, so but everybody's got the same challenge as a human. To, where can I learn and contribute? And so they, they go down that road. But um, you know, until until you start putting stuff up and you know hanging out your laundry, um, then everything can stay inside. I worked with. Uh, It reminds me of the, I, I worked with the guys, uh, there's a company called High Performance Systems. They made the software that uh, Peter Senge talked about in the fifth discipline. There are a bunch of guys who come out of MIT and they, they designed this, they, they made the software for systems mapping, modeling, and simulating. And uh, so I went out to take their class and I said, hey, I could teach some of these experiential things. I think I could help people learn what you're teaching faster. And I was talking to the guy who was ahead of the training, and uh, he turned his computer around while we were sitting at his desk. And he said, well, here's the, the systems model. Here's the, the, the model for how we do the training and how we are growing the, the base of users and teaching this to the world. And I, I was able to say, well, see, if, if I did this in the workshop, We would increase this factor here that would make more of these and increase those. I could work directly in his mental model. Hmm. I felt like I could, like the old switchboard operators making connections. I felt like I could make connections in his brain. It was remarkable. So that I, I could say exactly the things that he needed to know in order to make the connections, and he could then decide if he agreed with, but I was making my assumptions connect directly to his assumptions. And wow. it was, it was a fan, you know, it's just a remarkable conversation that always stood out. Um, so that visibility um, matters. I mean, that's what they talk about in, in dialogue in the MIT guys and suspending assumptions. Mm -hmm. Not that you let go of them, but it's suspending assumptions is about suspending them in front of you so that you can yeah. examine them and everybody else can too. That's the hard part. That's the hard part to make it easy or not, not easy in the sense well, of, that, I mean, like, I mean, people can only go into that so fast. They, they have to learn their own, they have to decide safety. It's a safety thing. I can't walk in and say, well, I've just opened a safe space. So you are now safe. Do the things that safe people do. Yeah. They always have the choice. I can say everybody here has things to learn and has things to contribute. Let's maximize that. Yeah. 
figure out what that means to you. And that never fails. I mean, because people want to, they, they want to get better. They want to contribute, um, ultimately. Um, and, uh, so sometimes they, they, they will just need the space to do that. Yeah. And enterprise scrum to me is ongoing open space. We just leave all that stuff up on the wall. That's and cool. and we keep we keep putting it up, and we don't have to schedule breakouts, and we don't have to do anything fancy. I, I, we just glad, have to keep learning together. I'm glad you you, you bring it up because um, what, what, when you see the title of what we are doing right now on the uh, Facebook and this gathering of this Scrum Bear online because we cannot mm. gather together, and um, now I don't see any questions. Well, we, kind of, we have a hello from Barbara, but nothing much. Well, what I see because the title I had the uh, the daring to say like why is enterprise scrum the best for business agility? So actually, I said the best. I could have said the smartest. Well, whatever. Sometimes the qualificative and every language that I know is not important because just like the. But for me, I mean, like uh, when I've been introduced to enterprise scrum, my understanding is. What I like is the openness of, let's call it system or framework for lack of, mm -hmm. but the way you just express it tonight with me, with the connection from the open space and all this way of flowing the ideas into something that we could actually not deliver instead of business delivery or financial delivery, but anything that it is important for anyone who is in charity, government, business, uh, commerce, to actually make a living. Isn't it at this point, like the, the, the straight point up? Like we, if we create enterprise, why are we creating enterprises? Because we have an idea, we have a product, we have our services. Stuff we, that I can't do by myself. I, yes. Right? I need somebody else. Exactly. And, 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 Peter and maybe a few other say, people, and then we need more of them. Yeah, but when we say offline a couple of weeks ago when we were talking, like I remember that because it rang a bell. So if you don't have any customer, you don't have your organization, you don't have your you know, the price. Mike loved Mike loved to say that. If yeah, you don't yeah. if you don't <laughs> if you do not have a customer, you do not have a business. Exactly. But you think it's <laughs> and, and then he just chuckled because you were stuck. <laughs> but but I'm at the same point, like it's 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 too Two way or the other way, either you create things that you don't need well, and sell them, or you create things that, as you said, yeah. like, I cannot make it myself. I need someone else. And me, go, go back that. to your, I want to go back to your question about why enterprise scrum might it's be the, the best as far as whatever. To um, business agility. We used to talk, my, Mike used to say, uh, it, it, he, he, he called it a framework, but then when we peel that back, it wasn't about a process or a structure or a um, a set of rules, right? Mm -hmm. It was a language for change and development and learning, and it, it was a language for work. So all of this stuff is meant to help us describe and prescribe to ourselves, but, but first describe what it is that our purpose is and then what it is that we might have to do about it and what we might need in order to be able to do about it. You can organize all this stuff, but it was ultimately a, a you know, a, a offered as a language for describing what we needed to do, all the different kinds of things we need to do in order to get the results we want. And that, when we start from that perspective, we can make great progress, even if we never end up with a wall of stickies that have coded, you know, dollars in the one corner and hours in another corner and dates and names. And, you know, Mike had ways to, I mean, I remember the Kanban guys, the Scrum guys, the Enterprise Scrum, there's ways to, to get way into the details and put lots of information on the wall. And you can do that and that's good if that's the kind of guys you are. 
But and, and if everybody says like we need to see it too, I mean like yeah, because like that. and that's and that's your language. You, that's you, your engineers, and you you do that analysis, and you're going to add this stuff up and track a velocity chart and all this stuff. And so, in any event, um, I've seen really great things happen. We we worked with the the economic uh, development office or you know department in a in a medium sized city, and they came to me and they said, "Well, economic development is these eight teams." And I said, "Well, that's a lot." They said, "Well, we'll start with these three, the three big ones, and they're all about." Bringing people to to town to uh, bring in businesses into town, and we started talking, and we found out that they weren't really three teams at all. They were one team who happened. They, they had three pieces of work, but they were really it was the same team. It was the same people on the team, right? But they talked about it as this team, that team, this team. Mm -hmm. so, Wait, no, no. See, okay, so we get all that together. They, had made, they started out, they put three canvases up. We, okay, one canvas. Now we can get into the, now that we're not chasing different parts of people into different pieces of work and we got it all together in one team, now we can look at um, who's the customer. Ah. Who, and, and because we have these things represented in the most, canvas. Most important stakeholder of all. Well, we said, and, I, I was able to, to, you know, in the same way with the high performance system, working with the mental models, said, look, the mayor, this was blasphemy when I said it, the mayor is not your customer. <laughs> the mayor is your boss. That's about governance and leadership and boundaries, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the businesses you're trying to bring to town are not your customer. So you can't give them anything they want. You can't just cut all their taxes and you know just give the place away they're your stakeholders maybe they are resources they are they're someplace else on the canvas the customers are the people who live in town and pay the taxes and have asked you to help them sell their labor to companies that you can find around the region or the country or the world so that's that's different now when they uh, they did this for a while, they said that now, okay, so we, we flesh out some of that and they say, okay, what's the PVL? What are you actually doing? What's the real work? And they said, well, there's all these emails and there's these plans and these documents and these, well, we made these posters for the media. And like, you got all these ways of visualizing the work and it's all in 16 different medium, you know, different media and, and shapes and some of it's physical paper in the office and some of it is came out of a computer and is in different I mean it's practically on floppy disks some of it. I mean it's like <laughs> scattered. It couldn't be more scattered, right? So they swept all that together. And once they did that, they said, this isn't working for us at all. There's too much. We don't know how to make sense of it. And and then they noticed that the mayor was out and because the mayor was pulling on them always oh the other thing they said is we don't have any customer feedback we need customer feedback um we need more customer feedback and and i said well i think it's just the opposite guys the newspapers write about the city government every day you get feedback every day the mayor goes out and and says has lunch with a bunch of uh business people or community people or whatever and he comes in and says, hey, I heard this, this, this. We got to do these things. Stuff mm -hmm. is piled. You're getting tons. I said, let's shorten your cadence. Let's shorten your cycle so you have a better chance to deal with stuff immediately and you don't get so thrown off, right? So we made that adjustment. And then they looked, eventually, they looked at the mayor's six buckets of six strategic priorities that he had put out there as kind of political Make nice fodder stuff, you know. And it's it's the it's the, the the stuff that nobody disagrees with that he had said we're going to move on these six initiatives, you know, these six themes. I said uh, they came back and said, well, we're going to reorganize our spreadsheet. All the things we found to do, we're going to tag them all with those things. 
And we noticed that if they then, I said, do it this way, guys. Don't put a single column in your spreadsheet. Make six columns so that you can tag multiple things. Now add up the columns, the tags, so that the piece of work that crosses, you know, checks the box off on four of the mayor's six things, highest priority. First cut, highest priority, because it it's gonna make the most people happy. Right? So in that way, they were able to take all these disparate things they were, I mean, and there was the stuff they thought they needed to do because they were the economic development experts, and there were the things that the mayor said, I gotta do this so we can get elected again. And everything in between, <laughs> stuff, you know, time projects time. of everybody in the place. And so, so, so the question is because now they made is... sense of this. And the punchline last, uh, I, and then I, I, I shut up for a minute. But uh, we knew we'd won this game when two things happened. The team came back and said, "We just got this whole huge thing uh, dumped on us." And one of the team members said, I can't deal with this. I got to visualize it. And he, he couldn't, he, he wouldn't talk to anybody until he had typed, until it all got into the spreadsheet. And the other piece of news came back when the director of economic development said, I oversee these other teams, the ones we had talked about in the beginning, the, the other five. And uh, one of them is a film office, and I'd sure like them to start doing this. This is a great way for me to interact with you guys and to to go between you guys and the mayor and the chief admin officer. So, so when when they adopted it for another team and when the team said, "Oh my gosh, this is complicated. Let's visualize it," um, I knew that that even if they threw away everything that ever had my name on it, forgot everything I ever said and we did together, they were still this had gotten in, and that was gonna. That was going to be remembered, and it was going to come back when they needed it, anytime yeah. later. So, so they were pleased in that sense, because your two yeah. points is they need the visual from now on, and they achieve more than they thought they could. Yeah, the interesting thing now that you point out, it pleased the current. The, the team needed it in the details, and the director needed this kind of stuff from the high level, and in, in order to be able to communicate to the mayor. Mm -hmm. So, um, it it worked on both ends. So that's the that's great. Yeah, I like it because often, like I had a client last year, actually, medium business, 150 people, and um, when I uh, start helping them, because the purpose is this: is we we are there to help them see their own uh, two column. Because I like that, like. Uh, what we have to do and what we can't do because of either the culture, the structure, or the will of uh, the ownership, the, the owner of uh, the company or what have you. And when they make it visual, and I'm not, not necessarily agree on everything, but I will say like, yes, we don't agree with the entire list, but yes, the top five or the top 10 of things we mm. can't do and we should do because we need that and this and that. This should be our priorities and, and stuff. So, so often the fact that I gather people together, that's one of the punchlines, as you said, like for me, I don't care if they don't remember me, but at least they, the comment I receive often with those companies is the fact that we are so glad that now we could talk to each other yeah. transparently and we, are, we, we still disagree on the stuff on the wall but at least we have it on the wall and we, we keep those we disagree on the kind of a backlog because it's important for our co-worker that at some maybe someday we'll make them up the, the list, you know? So I like that because they will say we agree to disagree, but now at least we could talk to each other and we still see that not important thing to do or not do, but it's yeah. there. So for me, it's kind of a fulfillment moment when I hear them saying like, uh, they will say, ah, oh, you make us see Michael or Alexandre, but no, actually you did that. We were just enabler of this with a technique or 
a way, uncovering a ways, helping you uncovering ways that will be best for you. So that's my kind of uh, lesson learned on fulfillment. Uh, it sometimes is, is better than the pay that I receive. Yeah. Because uh, people will feel fulfilled about the work they could see they have to do, and especially when they actually accomplish it. And especially when you, you could actually, of course, it's not always uh, pinky like this. So I had some organization like the people who were doing stuff were happy with uncovering new ways. But they never had like the manager or the leader coming with them. They kind of, they kind of couldn't care less. But at least I helped them agree that the impediment, he should take care of it. Because if you want something, you have to put his neck onto the, the thing as well. So he might not want to participate in the open space or what have you, or coming with his vision. So he delegated to someone else to have the vision. Fair enough. So now, uh, as a great coach, you support that person that has delegation from the owner, let's say. Okay? Yeah. I don't know if you see what I, so so at some point like you, we have we have to adjust uh, these things and sometimes it's more than techniques or or ways of of doing things. It's, well, the you know we talked about. I mean, you were asking questions about corporate environment and you know it gets difficult, right? Yeah. It's, because it's kind of like when we talk in in political economic terms about capitalism. Well, we, you know, oh no, we have to preserve capitalism. And I, I'm not meaning to debate that here. I just want to point out that we don't really have capitalism. When you look at what pure capitalism is, it, this isn't what we live in, right? No, we so, yeah, and, and so we, we have, um, there are all kinds of constraints on all kinds of markets. So in any event, we, we have um, these corporate, settings are, are constrained. Um, you don't get to just go in and say, hey, I discovered Scrum. Why don't we all sit around and read this book that Jeff Sutherland wrote or read the guide and then let's tinker around with it for a few weeks and see if we can learn it. No, it's like, here, read this tonight and come in and you're going to be a Scrum team tomorrow. Um, but so I'm, I was thinking earlier back to a time when I was a Scrum master for a team, I was a replacement scrum master because the first one had gotten chewed up in the first like three sprints. You could and replace a scrum master. She, 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 she got spit out. She, she was like, I'm not doing this. And so then they plugged me in. And this team, I mean, the reason she got spit out is because the team wanted nothing to do with scrum. And they refused to, you know, they had a room. They refused to sit in it. They they didn't. Okay, that was the full lean uh, type of thing, like stuck in a room with the board that you don't work. Okay. Yeah, this, so this was, um, they had been through the training. And they were told how to do it, but they wanted nothing of it. And they were on a short project. I think it was maybe uh, five, six months in total it was going to be. Um, and... Uh, the CEO was watching. They were making a, a tool that was going to allow everybody who made money for the company to know how the new pay structure was going to work. So everybody cared about this. It had to be right because it was going to tell people what they were going to make. And if you pissed all those people off, they might go quit. And then they get the revenue with them, right? They were the sellers. So... Anyhow, so the whole thing is under this time crunch, the CEO uh, spotlight crunch, this you've got to do scrum, you've got this huge challenge, but you've got to do it this new way. And they just would squirm anywhere but the spotlight in that room. They, they, like, the, like they thought the room was bugged or something and they didn't want to. Yeah, but that, that's the thing, Michael. Now, so a... here's the thing. So they come in. And you know, I come in and we do this. We go through a couple of couple of sprints, and we're playing the game. And they're fighting it all the way. So on, I don't know, the 
probably third or fourth retrospective, they came into the room. They would come in because they had to do, they had to meet someplace, so they might as well meet in their room. They came in to the scrum room, to the, the team team room. And I had taken down everything I had put up on the walls. I took every marker, every story point, uh, you know, uh, uh, little, uh, planning uh, poker uh, card, uh, all of the tools. I had pushed all the chairs away from the table. They came in, they sat down. I said, no, no, this isn't a sitting meeting. We're not, we're not going to have, I'm like, we're going to back away from all the tools. We're only going to have the table because we got to hold this stuff. Now I'm going to leave. You guys still have to deliver on time. You have to put the, the work in JIRA so that people can see what's going on. And I don't know. I think you can't pay your, you can't change your pay grades or something. But you know these things are all cut in stone, right? Mm. The well, rest is completely up to you, right? So if you don't want anything that's on this table, put it under the chairs. I'll get rid of it. Do whatever you want with the wall, whatever. But your job is to figure out what your process is going forward, right? And I walk out. And I come back in 20 minutes and they laugh and say, uh, we're blowing everything up. I said, oh, my. Oh, dear. Oh, no. OK, I'll come. It sounds like you're not done. I'll come back later. I come back in another 20 minutes. <laughs> what they did in that time, fighting me, apparently, all through that retrospective, is they owned it. Once they made their process, if it didn't work, it was on them. So we got to the ownership we wanted. We just did it the hard way because that's what kind of they kind of insisted on. But the, the best part of this story was when the program manager came to me later in the afternoon, kind of, but, 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 what did you do? Big guy, um, big gentle guy, but was stirred up and just flummoxed that, that what did you do i heard you walked out of the retrospective and like told them they could do whatever they wanted yeah why not you weren't imposing the rules you know like like or my how could you, like, the room whoa what, you didn't know yeah, what what could have happened what would you like you didn't know what was going to happen i said no i didn't and he said but 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 i said i called him by name i said Man, you have a dog? And he looked at me like, this is not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> and uh, you see, it was a question now. He, he chews me out like uh, up and down. And I say, do you have a dog? And he says, uh, well, yeah. I said, well, you probably got a fence in the backyard. Said, well, yeah. I said, you put a leash on before you send the dog out in the backyard? No. Because the dog isn't going to go anywhere. I said, and I waved my hand. I said, look out and look out in the space. And it was a, a sea of cubes. I said, man, how far were they going to run? You know how boxed in we are? You, you know what a container this is? Yeah. Where were they going to go? What danger was there? He gave me a harumph and walked away. He said, don't ever do that again without telling me you're going to do it. <laughs> but that was not uh, a true uh, open, uh, innovative, uh, business agility, uh, scrum lean environment. Uh, having uh, here and your story, your story is great. I think like uh, that's the thing, like a scrum master should actually uh, just facilitate things and that's it. And coach and- You have really to convene cool. stuff that the people want to talk about. The what? You have to convene the conversation. I mean, open space doesn't work if you put up the issues that nobody wants to talk about and make them come to it. Exactly. You have to put up a thing that they want to talk about, and they that's want not, to talk about blowing up the process. That's so what I'm saying. So, have at it. So that's what I'm saying. So were you in that context a consultant or a permanent worker? For I was a, I was a contractor. I was a, I was a scrum master uh, contractor. Yeah. Okay. 
Because for me, if a, if a program manager come or whatever is wait, uh, starting to talk uh, shit like this to me, I will say like, so you, you're better than me in a sense because you ask him about a dog and <laughs> give an image of thing. Because for me, I will say like, it's all about the team. And the team needed that kind of shark wave, and they will achieve better now. So, who you, who are you, to tell me as a programmer? I didn't know if they were going to achieve better or not, but I figured this is the best shot. We got to blow up the things. If they're going to fight with not each other, but just fight with the process all around, mm -hmm. as long as they held on to those. I mean, that's um, that's one of these things. You know why we can't? The yeah. reasons why we can't produce this, this software is because we're getting screwed with scrum so i had to let them go and you know they only had like three more iterations until they had to deliver something anyway so well, like, michael michael i think you and i we've been we've been in scrum for what 20 years roughly one way or another one way or another didn't you realize at some point that scrum is just a word oh yeah well i, I knew before they, they let me in I told, I mean, Chet and Ann told me what yeah. the, you know, those guys told me what Agile was. I said, you're making software in open space. Yeah, but. This is just, it's paper and markers. Let's, let's, let's drop, let's drop all the naming. Let's drop yeah. all the tagging for a second. It's not, it, no, because, it's just people what, talking what? And, and being committed to getting stuff done. <laughs> yeah, because lately I realized that sometimes people will come to me or ask my team and says like, oh, we'd like to, we'd like to do Agile. So that. That's one thing that I like very much to hear, and uh, we'd like to uh, to to you to train us uh, doing Scrum. I said, okay, so you have all those names, but when I meet the team, both business and IT or what have you, and we start like uh, I'm not doing a big assessment. I'm not too far about this. I, ju I just want to listen to them to mm -hmm. understand their context, their product, what they want to achieve, and so on. So, so it's a, it's not an assessment of uh, Gartner or all those uh, agile, lean, intelligent, uh, stupid, big framework stuff. No, no, no. It's just, I think, yeah. getting to know Michael Orman or Incorporation and uh, what do you do, who is doing what, and what kind of work you achieve. And, stuff. and then all of a sudden, I will say, like, okay, so uh, among you guys, who would like to be the kind of a pilot episode? or the I, I, Because a lot of people love uh, TV shows. So I make the analogy of TV shows. So who would like to be the pilot episode? Meaning the team that will be actually practicing something, and and I remember one of the sudden after one week of kind of, uh, for me I know in the background I was helping them doing a kind of a release planning, or sort of speak, but I didn't put any words into it because I let them create and word their way of doing things, and all of a sudden one person who will love to become the scrum master or the team coach come to me and she said like. Are we doing Scrum or Kanban right now? So I don't oh, know. Oh yeah, I've got I get that. I said, I don't know. You just choose for your context and your Does it matter? business. Doesn't matter to put a label onto it. And actually, I like I like the Spotify thing. Now since ING in Europe, they said, Oh, we are doing the squad and the Spotify. No, you just Spotify is not a system of, of it's not it's Scrum. And they decide to name it the way they want to make fun of it. And it's an emulation. Okay. I, I work for a company that do, um, uh, they do special effect here in Montreal. Mm. So of course, all their names, it's not a sprint. It's a scene. Right. Uh, so, you know, so they name it the way they want to emulate something that will speak to them. And uh, even like the product owner, it's not even, it's a producer. You right. see, for example, so who yep. cares? I have a place that they, I don't want to be a product owner. I don't have any product. I have services. I yep. said, but call yourself. Well, and, that, and that's what Mike, I mean, that, that's the, the owner and the of, coach. When, when I, the, the, the short story on how, what Mike did with Enterprise Scrum is he, he made the backlog include the visible backlog that was already visible in Scrum, but he made the backlog include all the stuff that we need to do as a system, as a team, yeah. and as in the environment. And he wrapped all that stuff around the real work. Yeah. So he made the backlog into a canvas. Then he generalized all the language, like you're saying. And yeah. I'm often oh, following ownership, like working with the city government, owner doesn't play very well. 
Yeah. But I say, okay, how are we going to keep the flow and momentum going? Keep, you know, who's going to, you know, look out for the practices as, you know, coach and who's going to set priorities? How are we going to set priorities? I'm interested in the functions. So I, I just let those labels go. Like I haven't come up with a thing that we really like in civic spaces. But uh, so, and then the third thing he did was allow those canvases where all the work could go up in whatever language is theirs um, and link them together. And I always liked that Steve Denning, uh, mm. who you mentioned earlier, he, uh, he describes the organization of the 21st century as having three characteristics, being defined by teams instead of individuals, uh, uh, network to connect them, and customers to be served. And in my view, Mike's network of canvases is the org chart of the 21st century. And you know because what? it shows all the teams. Yes. It shows all the networks or the you know the whole of the network and every canvas has a customer panel where everybody is working to serve some dimension of the customer. So it perfectly meets uh, perfectly describes or visualizes Steve Denning's example or his his uh, definition um in a way that uh and, unlike and, and the thing is that unlike the old org chart where everybody hands you the org chart and says well it's not really how it really works and it's not really quite up to date because so and so moved and this moved but the org chart of the 21st century as these canvases is always up to date and it's always the real work exactly it's alive it's alive, and, and the networking of Denning and Vito, for me, is, as a dropout of astrophysics, I see subsension. If you don't understand the, the dynamic of interrelation, the subsension, that it's constantly moving, like in space, with the atom, even like quantum and astrophysics, both merged together. So, and you know Mike was a physicist, right? Sure. This is why you understood. And like me, and, and we uh, got we got along. It's funny because I'm married to a physicist, really former former physicist. So yeah, it's uh it's for a while there I was swimming in physicists. But uh, for me, it's, it's this is why I fall in love with with Mike. Of course, it was the first Scrum book that I read, but I was back in 2002. I was far away to understand. Me. And so when I met him again, and we we share so much thing: the trans techno music, uh, the the physics and scientific approach, the empirism. That we should put into agile and believing that business agility is the true evolution of agile not the software not the engineer kind of crisis uh, revolution uh, let's do it for programmer by programmer and having always having nagging and stuff no the real stuff was to bring people together so i think this is why uh, the, the 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 best explanation that i received and especially he was a co-senator he says like from the inside he said like no we did that because we needed to make noise because we've been doing Scrum and Lean stuff for years and nobody was listening. So we gathered together, the 17 of us, and boom, we, we did a manifesto. Was it a communist thing? Was it a capitalist thing? Actually, for me, with the, after 19 years, I could truly see that was a true capitalist in the sense of that was there to make people more efficient than produce kind of more. It was like in the mindset of more, 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 but with a better relationship with that yeah. kind of work like so you know well and there's that and the thing that I, I i was reviewing some things the other day uh um sorting out some old stories and uh i came across my notes from the agile xp universe conference in 2002. the theme of the conference was essentially uh I won't get this exactly right, but it was essentially uh, how do we do as little work as we can and still build great software? And that dimension, uh, and, and you know, on the flip side, Harrison Owen has been telling people for years, you're working too hard, is his take on that, right? Yeah. And uh, so, the, the, and something I, I learned from, um, Somatics and the Tibetans and, and, and that sort of stuff is letting things be easy. And 
So to me, um, ultimately, I have to keep coming back to, well, where's the, I mean, to go to your river and that, where, where does the energy, where do the people want to flow? How do I, I keep exactly thinking the the same? How right? do I keep building a container, extending the container, and teach them to extend the container the themselves? Container to hold their open. own space. The container should be open. If you close down, you're gonna close and you don't achieve anything. And so it, the, it's not gonna stay closed. Not. The people are gonna leak out and and go someplace else and, and exactly. work for somebody else and contribute exactly. to something else. And this is not this is exactly what we see uh, in time. So. It's a repeat stuff of, of uh, unsatisfaction, non-fulfillment. If, if you're not satisfied or fulfilled, you cannot be happy. And happy is, is it a state? Is it a state of being or it's something that you'd like to achieve? So, so at some point, like being fulfilled often will make you happy, I think. But for that, you have to, to, go, to go onward and sense of... So the, the, flow, the flow state is not just in transcendental meditation. <laughs> It's it's yeah. amazing. Like you you have to be like at some point. I, as I said, like I don't understand why people love so much the complexity. At some point, they will always say like, "Oh, this is too complex. This is too volatile. Help us being like uh, lean or easier." And I said, "Yeah, well, yes, no problem." But you seem to love your slavery of complexity. You seem to love to hide behind um, any uncertainty or. You seem to be excited by that kind of danger. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a chemical reaction from our brain that I don't know because I'm not a chemist or a biologist. But it, I would be very interested in, in neuroscience to see what's happening in the brain sometimes when you try to brainstorm with people. And, and they well, talk. there's a, there's a word the the Greeks you know had the agora and and agoraphobia. Yeah. Is a fear of the marketplace. It's, it's, it's you know, it, it demands You're movement. Right. It demands are... movement and engagement and change. I mean, it's just. I mean, I know it's, change isn't. People are changing all the time, but it's. Um, but, it's really a dissolve. I mean, you never sit by a river and watch the drops of water going by screaming, and you never see the little the little trickle of water. Come floating off the, you know, the the waterfall. It, it trickles down and then drops into the big river. And mm -hmm. those little those little drops of water coming down the little tree, they're never screaming as they jump into the thing. No, but we we don't play it that way. And if we stay on the flow and the water, when you make a down, and you restrain the water, at some point, like the water will push, 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 and the water's in charge. The water's in charge. Okay. They just need a little kick sometime or a little love at that point because, of course, the Uber Dom, I think, is really solid. But um, you see what I mean? Like, at, at some point, like, the water, if, if I have to flow, it will have to flow. So every time I see organization... The, or people, the Hoover Dam is very strong, and it is yielding all the time. They're really? always letting water run through it. You see? Et voila. That's the, what I'm They don't... They don't stop the flow. No, but they you use the flow. They channel the flow, but they can't stop it, or the water would overflow the top, and it wouldn't matter, and it would go away. Exactly. So that so, you could not like there. There is there is forces in nature that you have to let it be, and I think the human interaction is 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 that kind of flow that we need. Well, and it goes back to the Emory and Trist uh, basic assumptions: people are purposeful. And can be ideal seeking that mm -hmm. purpose that caring you know you might or might not agree with it but they have it and they're going after it and you know but if where we can identify and invite uh people to work towards shared ideals i like mm -hmm. to make a distinction as, as they did between um visions and ideals Vision is sort of fuzzy and, and it's fantasy. When Harrison went in to DuPont and did the first open space with a bunch of polymer chemists, the situation being that they needed a, uh, some patents that would replace the nylon patents that were expiring, they said, we need a breakthrough like we've only seen maybe five times in the history of the company. Everybody there could tick off what those 
probably were, right? That gave everybody the scale, a, a clear view of the scale of market, of science, of work, of development time. That scaled everything for everybody because those were five tangible things that we needed to replicate. Something like that. That mm. wasn't a vision. That was an ideal. Yeah. You know, the sixth breakthrough was an ideal. That's the difference. Because what the vision is, you say it's fuzzy and the idea. Well, it's, it's, un, the, the, it, it's often, it doesn't have to be, but then it probably falls back toward ideals. When you, it's not concrete. It's abstract. Yeah. It's not anchored and grounded in stuff we all know. Mm -hmm. Like we can say in a beginning of a team, um, we can start talking practices that we think represent respect or focus or courage or any of these things. But you can't sign on to those things. Oh. You have to say, tell me, I mean, until we sit around and, and tell stories about, tell me something courageous you saw. And I'll tell you something courageous I saw once in an office like this. And those become our ideals. We have to ground them. We have to make them solid. So we know what they are. So it's either like it's, it's like the uh, cornerstone of even the value that we could. Yeah, it's it's the it's the it's the the solid form of values and vision. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry, values is what they objected to. Um, okay. What yeah. what they said they said values aren't enough. And and that work incidentally was coming out of that was coming from people who had watched. Uh, the Nazis run all over uh, Europe and wanted to know what had, there was a lot of talk at the time, um, study about values and the Hartman value profile that some people might have heard of, um, had 18 things and 18 statements and asked people to identify, uh, to prioritize them. And based on that, they identified value um, types because I wanted to understand how people who seem to have values could have allowed the things that happen in the world to happen. Oh. And so they, they wanted to figure out how, what values were as a thing was missing. So anyway, just. All right. Hey, Mike, I love it. I think we could become the uh, Joe Rogan of agility. And talk and talk for for hours and hours because it's been about two hours right now. And you didn't see the yeah, time. Well, I was just being by uh, Anna. She said there is a lot of messages that we should go. You and I read on on Facebook. So let me share my screen. If you don't mind, I hope. Uh, yeah. Hold on a second. How can I do that? Like this, probably. Yeah. Yeah, because I was very with you. So now she just texts me. She said, like, you better, there's nothing on Twitter. No question with the hashtag, apparently. Yeah. Do you see my screen right now? I do. You do? Um, okay. So let's, uh, okay, let's go back there. So Théogène just say, hi, guys. Okay. Shrini Vas from Montreal. Okay. Barbara. Hello. Barbara, Alex. Oh. love you. Barbara, say hello to the girls. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good job, guys. Uh, Ulis, oh, you remember Ulis? Ulis. From Mexico? Yeah. Hola, como estas? Certification are overrated. <laughs> 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 I like it. Let me. Can I? Uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> Absolutely. That actually, that's going to be my next topic on my Dare Real Agile podcast uh, because I'm doing a series calling Fake Agile. I did the difference between a coach and a scrum master last week in French. I'm going to do next month at the topic of certification with politics, even though I just received my, uh, my last scrum alliance certification that I did because I have time to waste called oh. a leadership. But I, no, but I liked it because for me, it's not the certificate itself. It's, it's at least exchanging with 25 people from 15 different countries. Right. And Gina about it. So that was great. So for me, I don't care if my coach give me or not the certification. Like when I did the CBAC with Mike, I couldn't care less having my CBAC. I was just glad to meet him again. And uh, 
And especially when <laughs> when I received that training, Mike, it was like two weeks before. Uh, he's oh, off. yeah. Man, you're talking about, I mean, yeah, it's great to be with people like that. But I did eight or ten of those trainings in Chicago with Mike. And it would be four days in a row. And my brain would be, I would be listening to Mike. I would be working out multiple canvases for myself and trying it out and doing things and then working with the group and then being part of the group I was doing all these things. The next week, my brain was goo. It was I just know. jelly. I couldn't think of anything. Um, those were so, so intense really? the learnings. Really? I thought, no, but okay, maybe. But me, oh, uh, the contrary, I was uh, after that, I, w I w was back to my hotel room and I was like, okay, I was like creating more stuff. And oh, writing. yeah, I did that for a week. Fine, but how long can I go like that? And then um, we go to dinner oh, and Mike, you know, we, we would talk more. and Me forever. I remember one day um, we had a drink after and uh, I, I gave him a, a tip, like, because, you know, in French, a tip is a full boy, it's four drinks. Uh, so I said, like, uh, what do you drink? He said, a gin. I said, no, you're kidding. I drink gin, too. So we start on gin. I don't, I don't uh -oh. know how many gin we had. So if Barbara is listening, <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I, think, I think it was Sue at some point. She said, like, you guys are uh, getting, like, pretty intense until the uh, mixing scientific and business. I said, like, I don't know. The gin is good here in New York. So <laughs> it was Luckily, like, you're out where you didn't have a keyboard or you would have been putting it all the music. Which music? I mean, oh, I just, if there'd been a keyboard, if you'd been in a bar with a piano that wasn't being played, then you probably would have been oh, yeah. jamming on the piano. For sure. For sure. But, uh, so now, let's see. So let's see. What is it? Julius says, I was certified Scrum Master by Mike Beadle on him too. You lucky guy. Half of the course talked about the press <laughs> Scrum. And it's been liked by Barbara, for sure. So, I'll see more. So, that's a long thing. Yeah. Um, and Mike was right. <laughs> yeah. IT area are not agile. Everything fall apart. Since since then, I've been very interested to this. Ah. And then, uh, I have a comment. It makes sense. The canvases, the framework, the way of work, etc., with projects of any type. However, agilize area, areas with no specific project, just work coming and go. Okay. So. Be right back, 46 minutes. So that's the thing. So probably Anna. Yeah, canvas gets weird. So somebody's got to stand up and say, hey, I think this canvas is getting weird. Yeah. We either, we either want it that way or we got to make it unweird. Somewhere on this, if if we review and improve everything on that canvas, somewhere we find a box that hasn't been tended to. But but again, we find me, something. I, I see I see most of canvases or whatever things to visualize thing as a screwdriver and armor. It's just tools. Well, here's the thing: like in this, um, you know, the work is just coming and going, and so recurrent work and stuff. I've done this stuff. Mike, Mike used to love to, to tell this story. You know, when I was in the trainings, he always brought it up because that's how he was. Um, I had pioneered the use of enterprise scrum with single software teams. And I took their cycle, uh, well, scrum team would call it a, a sprint backlog. I put it in the center of a whiteboard. And then I wrapped all the boxes around so that's that it? the canvas was just all these little boxes. And one of them, of course, is leadership management sort of context. And you get in the, the retrospective uh, or just the, 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 daily, uh, uh, the daily scrum, they, uh, they would say, oh, the, the, the boss tells us we have to go to this training. He's going to knock us out for a day out of this sprint. And so we put the, all the things that come up, all the obstacles that come up, they go somewhere in those boxes around the, the real work. So we put those up. And so we put a couple of these things that the manager was doing that was just screwing with these guys. And uh, I put those up. Well, those are mine to go raise with the manager. But I didn't take them to the manager. He's a micromanaging kind of guy. He comes around Snoop looking for what's the team doing and what's, the, what's on the board. He comes to me and says, why is my name on the board? I said, oh, the team's <laughs> been talking about you and they got some issues. 
is transparency. So the board, board raised the, he, he came to me saying, what's the obstacle? How come I, like, and he didn't like it, but I, better than me having to go knock on his door and say, I got to talk to you about being a problem. He at least had the news broken to him by the board. <laughs> and then we could address it. So that's the kind, that's why I say some if some aspect of the board if the board gets weird, then and it's not working, you know, then then there's some things we're not exactly. talking about, and we have to address it, and they have to be weird. Let's question it so addressed somehow perfectly. And uh, anyway, weird. Uh, if we go into the David Lynch type of thing, it could be nice to be weird. Depends if if your team like to be the weirdness of things. You heard that expression mm. from David Lynch? The awareness of things. But again, like to be seriously, I agree with you. And I think Liz could just like, if it's weird or if something like not exactly. So we have to address it, erase it and start from, not from scratch, but at some point, you know, to to make it even like- Improve, simple. review and improve. Yeah, yeah. we have review to review and improve. Because is weird mean ambiguity or it doesn't mean something like, uh, uh, so we have to address it. And Barbara was asking us because, so yeah, of course it's it's plus six hours for her and pollen. So stay, stay. I hope you record. Yes, I did. So our job is to wrap it up before she wakes up. What do you say? <laughs> Why can I comment here? I don't understand. Ah, because I'm on Zoom. Is it? No. I'm experiencing well, a bad like user it. experience right now between Zoom and Facebook, ladies and gentlemen. This is not really as that. I tried it's just kind of a delay that, that is hard to look at. If you oh, maybe, but I'll that. I'll go I'll go after anyway. I'm with you right now. Anyway, and um, you this says great talk. Hopefully, in the future we can have more interaction. Of course, but the thing you list, my dear friend, I did two online forum where I had like 20 people on this uh, the thing. So now tonight I wanted to have more one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with an interaction uh, to the chat. But that's an experiment, you know? So maybe we, if we do, let's say, if we do like a homecoming or a, a get together of Enterprise Scrum, I won't think I will do live on Facebook anyway. What do you think, Michael? Let's say we, we gather all the people were there at least on October, 2017. Well, we have to see who's still playing and yeah. Who still cares and yeah, I mean, whether it's a a few people or a lot of people or a few people and a bunch of new people or you know whatever, we could just do a Zoom and breakouts and just do an online open space. Exactly. Why not? Why not? So, so that's an option, you list. Because for me, lately in the last two years, um, I interact with you a little bit with you and all the gathering we did the last year in Austin. With Simons was there. Uh, I met John uh, in London also once. Uh, Karim three times. But uh, Karim, I don't know if he was necessarily there because I know he's an associate. Karim Arbot, you know him? He's uh, um, the associate of uh, John McFadden. Uh, he. So I think we've met, but I don't know where. I can't yeah, remember last, if it was there. Austin, he was there. So probably Austin, know. he was there. Yeah, he was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't in October. I don't think he was in no. with John and Simon no. um, for the October no. conference at Mike did. So, uh, so that, that, uh, let's see quick on LinkedIn. Paul Yunus. I'm unable to, really? Uh, okay, so well, doesn't seem there there were questions except for release, but that was a that was a thing. Uh, I think uh, yeah, Ulysse and you is the two people from the the Beatles that I interact the most in the last two years. I will say Barbara from time to time for sure too. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that would be great actually if uh, we could start flying again even to do a, a real open space uh, in front of each other. So I was expecting maybe in New York we could gather again, uh, but they canceled the Scrum gathering. 
Mm. Remember, we even proposed with Simons to to talk uh, again, but mm, that was canceled. So I don't know if. Uh, well, we just have to. We'll find our opportunity, with yeah. or without the airplanes, and uh, you know, we we just figure out what. Uh, my my feeling is going to be twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two. You know, our borders between you and I is still closed. Not from the United States, but from our group yes. here in Ottawa. It's yes. Like uh, you want to extend the closing till July the 31st. That's crazy. I mean, like. You have to come, you have to come all the way over and then drop down into my state in Idaho. And uh, I, I think, I think it's, if there's any place you can get in, it must be here in Idaho. <laughs> I, I think so. Maybe I, Montana. Okay, let me let me let me cut the live and I'll stay with you <laughs> if you don't mind because that would be personal. So thank well, you so everybody you. for watching it and um, thanks to anybody who managed to listen this far. <laughs> this far and uh, watch for the replay on the Agile Lounge uh, YouTube channel and uh, we might see about the audio how good it is and we might do it as a podcast as well. The Dare Real Agile podcast with the great Michael. Well, Earth. and anybody who listened this far. You got to email us and tell us you want to come because you got to be interested in this and tell us that you want to be part of a, a live conversation with us uh, on Zoom or face to face or something to yeah. explore more about Enterprise Scrum and, and tell more stories. So, Great idea. So from from this Facebook page or whatever, even though no, if you are that far, as Michael said, write us and let's say us is coach at agile dash lounge.com and we'll make we'll make contact with you and uh, we'll expand this so let me end this so thank you very much everybody